Yes, the numbers are going up, and yes, we're in the midst of the second wave of the COVID-19 pandemic in Ontario, and yes, the economy is still in pretty desperate condition. But someday this will all be behind us. We'll have a vaccine, businesses will reopen. The question then becomes, how do we grow this wounded economy to create new jobs and lower our stratospheric deficits? We have four guests who spend an inordinate amount of time thinking about just that. And so we introduce them, as is our custom here on the agenda, from furthest away to closest to our studio, starting in Vancouver, British Columbia, with Jim Stanford. He's the economist and director of the Center for Future Work. And three guests in the nation's capital. In downtown, Trevin Stratton, chief economist and vice president at the Canadian Chamber of Commerce. In the Glebe, Pamela Cross, lawyer and tax partner with the firm BLG, Borden Ladner Gervais. And in Nepean, Ontario, economist Armin Yalnesian, Atkinson Fellow on the Future of Workers. And it's great to have you four on our program tonight. Here is the problem that we have invited you four in to fix. Are you ready? Sheldon, bring up this graphic and let's explain what's up here. We have just undertaken the largest annual decline in economic output on record. We've lost 1.2 million jobs between February and May of 2020. The Ontario budget deficit of $37.2 billion is what's projected for the year 2020-2021. The economy is expected to grow 5.1% in Ontario next year, but it fell 6.8% this year. Obviously a mismatch. And even with an economic rebound, Ontario is still expected to be off by more than 300,000 jobs. All of those numbers courtesy of a new study that just came out from the Financial Accountability Office of Ontario, which has done a lot of good work looking into the economic ramifications of this pandemic. Okay, we are going to break up our discussion essentially into three different parts. Do we need spending increases or spending cuts going forward? What do we want to do about taxation policy? And give me any other bright ideas you might have. So those are the, essentially the three areas of investigation. And I want to start Jim, start us off on this. Let's see if we can agree on what the mission ought to be here. I would assume that job one is to get the 300,000 plus people in Ontario who lost their jobs uh, back into the workforce. And I assume that all of the policy prescriptions I'm going to hear from you for are going to be aimed to doing just that. But maybe I'm wrong in that assumption. So you tell me, what's job one in this pandemic? Hmm. I hate to be predictable, Steve, but you're 100% right. Job one is getting those jobs back, no doubt about it. Uh, this uh, huge deficit, and it, huge is the only word you can use that Ontario faces, is absolutely the result of the decline in the economy, the lost revenues, the lost jobs, uh, and of course, the increased spending uh, to try to fight uh, COVID, prevent infection, and also support some of the households uh, through this terrible time. So. Um, uh, the solution is clear. We're going to have to ride out this uh, catastrophe. Um, the government is going to absolutely have to maintain its spending and probably increase it, uh, frankly, in at least the medium term. And then as the economy reconstructs and we put people back to work paying taxes instead of uh, collecting CERB and some of the other income supports that we put in place, uh, that deficit will naturally come down. The key tightrope the government's walking now is that it cannot derail the recovery in jobs by obsessing about debts and deficits. I think that's one of the major risks we face right now. Trevin, post-pandemic, what's going to be job one? Well, I mean, job one, number one right now is obviously getting the pandemic under control, and that certainly needs to be the priority. There won't even be an economic recovery until we're able to do this. Um, but when it comes to the economy itself, I, I agree with Jim. Our priority needs to be getting Canadians back to work. Canadians cannot return to their normal lives until they're gainfully employed. Um, and it's clear right now with the second wave in certain parts of this country um, that we're in what a lot of economists like us are calling a K-shaped recovery, um, where some sectors, the ones that almost require physical presence for their business models to work, um, have shut operations once again, and they're going to be some of the hardest hit sectors. At the same time, there are other sectors of the economy that have started to recover and are near where they were pre-pandemic. Um, and so despite a lot of the support provided to Canadians and businesses during this time period, at the end of the day, it won't be governments that create jobs, it's businesses that do. Uh, and so those sectors that are at the top side of the K, we need to be able to put in place the policies that will stimulate investment and growth for the economy to create those jobs. You know, just as in every downturn, um, it's first felt on Main Street when the lights begin to go out and every recovery is going to start when the open signs begin to reopen. And we'll talk about some of those specifics as we go forward. Okay, Armin, take us to... 
post-pandemic. We've got the thing under control. Now we have to figure out what's job one. What do you say it is? It's so difficult to put my mind there right now, Steve, because we are looking at an unpredictable amount of economic devastation. Some of the businesses on Main Street that Trevin, Main Street that Trevin was talking about will not survive. And the longer the pandemic goes on, the more will not survive. And in smaller towns, that's going to reshape Main Street far more than anything that public policy can do. So getting people back into jobs is not an easy thing. I think in the immediate interim, I'm not sure that this is the government to do it, but I think in the interim, getting the work done that we need, which involves rebuilding physical and social infrastructure to be able to maintain purchasing power and get the stuff done that we need done, because on the other side of COVID is population aging um, and a tightening labor market, notwithstanding technological changes. Uh, so uh, I think we need to get used to the idea of governments doing more than they have in the last 40 years going forward. And a lot of governments have an allergy to thinking that way. Now, when you say, I'm not sure that this is the government to do that, are you talking about the Ontario or federal government? Yeah, no, the Ontario government. I think we're talking about the Ontario um, the Ontario economy. So I was thinking about what can the Ontario government do? Of course, the appropriate level of carrying debt and deficit is at the federal level. So I think it's entirely appropriate that the um, there have been several provinces getting together and saying that the feds have to, have to do more on a lot of different fronts. And I think that's exactly the right way to finance the future of the work that we need done, which will be more through the public sector than we're used to. Okay, Pamela. If we do it right. If we do it right. Pamela Cross, job one is what? I, I agree that job one is getting people back to work, but I think that we have to appreciate that we are in a global environment and we really do need to make sure that Canada's systems are competitive because our borders are very porous. They're porous in terms of capital inflows and they're porous in terms of our labor force. And I think that the the pandemic has actually accelerated some of the changes that were probably coming down the road in any event, but we really do need to make sure that the responses here enable our businesses to actually grow and succeed in a very, very competitive global market. And, and that is something I think that will challenge all levels of government as they try to retreat from some of the supports that they put in place and have that um, filled by the private sector. I really do think we have to keep our eye on what's happening globally. Okay, Jim, I'm going to put you in the Premier's office, let's say about a year from now, when presumably we have a vaccine, people are taking it, there's more confidence that people are going back to work, uh, and, and you've got his ear to give him some advice on the following. Premier, the deficit's through the roof, you're going to have to cut spending, or Premier, the deficit may be through the roof, but you can't stop spending. What's the advice? Oh, certainly a, a year from now, even if we had the vaccine tomorrow, Steve, uh, my advice would be the same. Uh, you cannot stop spending. Uh, the private sector does create jobs, as Trevin says, but where I disagree with Trevin is the idea that the government doesn't create jobs. That's absolutely wrong. The government creates a lot of jobs. In fact, the share of uh, jobs in the economy that is gonna be attributed to public services, public infrastructure investment, uh, direct public sector hiring is going to grow, uh, not just during the pandemic, but for the next three or four or five years. Uh, experience shows that when you've had a shock like the one that we're going through, uh, the private sector does not just snap back magically. Uh, consumer confidence is damaged, uh, incomes are damaged, business investment is down, many businesses aren't surviving. And this is where you absolutely do need government to get the ball rolling in terms of the normal macroeconomic momentum. Uh, that contributes to uh, job creation and income growth and rising tax revenue. So uh, I think economists around the world, including surprisingly, the IMF and the World Bank last weekend at their annual meeting said governments do not stop spending. In fact, increase spending. If you get infatuated with trying to reduce the deficit, uh, we'll take what was a short-term supply shock from the pandemic and we'll convert it into a years-long depression. That's the risk that we face. So my advice today and next year will definitely be, uh, Premier, you have to increase spending on childcare, on healthcare, on schools, on physical infrastructure, 
uh, to get the economy, uh, get, get, it, get it some positive momentum once again. Armin, I'm going to assume that you're in the same meeting with the Premier as Jim is. And when the Premier comes back at you and says, I've got a deficit that's almost near $38 billion, and I just can't keep borrowing that much money year after year after year, what are you going to tell him? I'm going to say that what you've been doing thus far, Premier, and asking for assistance from the federal level is absolutely appropriate. Look, we are going to be facing a tsunami of debt because of COVID. Businesses are going to shutter. Households are at, you know, poised to either not be able to pay their mortgages or uh, not be able to pay their rents. You do not want the debt to balloon on the shoulders of those least able to afford it and who are paying the highest cost for that debt. We want, as far as the ecosystem of debt goes, to actually push it, shift the risk onto the shoulders that are the broadest, and that is going to be the federal level. So I think getting the federal government to be an equal partner um, in more of the spending, the deficit spending, is the route to go. I think this is not a great time to raise taxes. It might be the right time to close off certain tax loopholes. Hold off on that, Armin. We're going to get to taxation in a second. So, okay, you and Jim have had your meeting with the Premier and the Finance Minister, presumably, among others. And as you leave the Premier's office, you notice waiting anxiously to get in there for their time are Trevin and Pamela. So you all look at each other with a bit of a leery glance, and Trevin and Pamela go into the Premier's office, sit down. And Trevin, what are you going to tell the Premier of Ontario and his finance minister about what they ought to do on spending next year? So governments have a very important role to play in economic recovery, but putting Canadians on the government payroll is not necessarily an economic recovery plan in and of itself. Um, and I think a lot of the debate around debt and deficits is, I mean, it's, it's almost a false choice. You know, people frame it as either you're for austerity or because interest rates are low, you're for just unlimited spending. Um, and it almost ignores the really important questions, um, which is not whether we should be spending. I, I know very few people that are calling for austerity right now. It's how much can and should we be spending and what should we be spending it on? Uh, and these are very important questions considering, you know, the, the deficit that we've racked up so far. Uh, you know, there's an IMF study that came out earlier this week and Canada has the distinction of running the largest deficit amongst all countries at, you know, almost 20 percent of GDP. Uh, and so this is going to have, have a huge impact on, on Canada and Canadians. Uh, and so, you know, we have to think about, well, are we spending the right amount? Not necessarily is spending itself important, uh, but also what we're spending it on. Right. Uh, there was a report from RBC earlier this week as well, saying that in the second quarter, quarter of this year, the amount of transfers that went to households um, surged by a whopping $56 billion uh, versus $23 billion. Uh, that was a decline in earned wages and salaries. Uh, and so, you know, that $30 plus billion difference is money that could be spent on other aspects of economic recovery, whether it's childcare, whether it's infrastructure. And so these are the real important questions that we need to be asking. So you say that, and then Pamela, the finance minister, comes back at you and says, OK, give me some advice here. What do I do about taxation? Do I leave them the way they are? Do I raise them? Do I cut them? Which ones do I raise? Which ones do I cut? Pamela, help me here. What do I do? Well, in, we have a tax system that was last overhauled 50 years ago and could have done with an overhaul prior to this. Um, I, I think that one of the things that our tax system currently faces is as a challenge is the fact that it is overly complicated. And um, although I... I agree that, you know, certainly there's always been tinkering with loopholes um, in the tax system. I think that we are faced with a situation where we very quickly need to address some fundamental issues with the way our tax system um, works and the way it taxes certain types of activities in the business uh, community. For example, digital taxation is something we are really lagging behind on and as we can see with our current remote work, uh, working, businesses are adapting and will be much more digital in their approach to their own businesses. We need to make sure our tax system can adapt to something like that. Um, there are many, many situations where the tax system is just too complicated. I do think that the tax system has to simplify itself and align itself with the not just today's economy but the economy we're going to face as we come out of this challenge and and i do think there's a lot of work to be done to get us there 
the other speakers, rightly so, have said we have a lot of investments this we have to make, whether it's in healthcare or other important social policy issues. Those are funded in large part through the tax system. And we need to make sure that our tax system is competitive and will produce high paying jobs and strong businesses and support capital investment so that our private sector can help fund the challenges that we're going to have to pay for. To which Pamela the Premier would say, okay, I know I need a competitive tax system, but get specific with me. What taxes do I need to lower? Which ones can I raise? I think um, I would look at this in a staged approach. In the immediate, shorter term, there are a few things. There are some low-hanging fruit that, that really could be looked at. And the very first thing I'd say wouldn't even require a legislative amendment. We need our tax authorities to be much more attuned to the needs of our taxpayers. And when they're conducting audits, when they're engaging with taxpayers, there's been a lot written about how poorly our tax authority actually deals with taxpayers. The you know, Auditor General commented on the fact you can't even get a phone call answered. We need to get a lot of that out of the system. And then we need to bring in some low hanging fruit. We could look at some of the, of the solutions that other uh, countries have considered on the short term. Uh, things like providing some relief on consumption taxes to include to in, uh, improve consumer spending. Um, I don't agree we should be raising taxes. I think this is not something that, uh, that most taxpayers would be uh, uh, aligned with at, at this point in time. But I do think that there are some areas, digital taxation, potentially cons uh, consumption taxes, where we could try to give a, a holiday on consumption taxes to encourage consumer spending. There are some short-term wins that, that could potentially shore up the economy in a, in a different way. Trevin, after Pamela finishes her answer, uh, the executive assistant to the premier interrupts the meeting by saying, oh, guess what? I've got Justin Trudeau and Christian Freeland on hold. Can I put them on speakerphone and maybe you could offer them some advice, Trevin, while we're at it? What would you tell them to do on taxation? Well, I mean, in the largest de economic downturn in, in almost a century, I think it's important that we use all of the policy tools at our disposal. And tax policy is a very important tool that we can use for economic recovery. Uh, and in fact, it's already been helpful to people, right, in terms of small businesses and tax deferrals that have taken place uh, already during the first wave of the pandemic. Um, and as our economy continues to operate below capacity, you know, there are a lot of really short term things that we can do with our tax system that would help Canadians and help businesses, right? What about automating filing for or simple tax returns, right? Uh, if you are a low-income single mother with uh, two children, you can lose as much as $13,000 if you don't file a tax return or renew your eligibility for the Canada Child Benefit. Uh, and so this is this is money that's already in the system that you can be able to use, right? Enhancing the deduction for childcare expenses, um, as as was mentioned by Pam, a temporary HSD holiday, as has been done in a number of other countries in Europe as well. Uh, you know, we have also seen changes taking place in the economy right now that will require changes to our tax system, like with individual Canadians working from home. And there's a form, a T2200, that you have to fill out. Um, if all the Canadians that are working from home fill this out, it's going to be 20 million pieces of paper that are going to have to be filed at CR. Why not just have that as a box that you can check in your actual filing and in your tax return itself? Uh, and then there are other aspects too. You know, I, I think a lot of us agree that taxes shouldn't be going up uh, in the middle of a pandemic. You know, there is an escalator tax that's scheduled to go up on alcohol in, in April too. And why not put a pause on things like this until we're out of this? Uh, you know, there are really short term things that we can do, but then absolutely over the longer term, we haven't, you know, done a comprehensive review of our tax system in, in over half a century. A number of other countries have, like the UK, like New Zealand, um, that has resulted in, in economic growth in them doing so. Um, and it's looking at how to adjust the tax mix um, to be able to make our economy more competitive and attract investment and create jobs at the end of the day. Okay, the Premier's executive assistant walks in and says, you two out. I want to hear from the other two right now. Jim and Armin walk back in. The Prime Minister and the Finance Minister federally are on the speakerphone as well. And they all ask, Jim, what do we do on taxes? Do we raise them? If we do, which ones? I really want to be at this meeting, Steve. I, I'm loving this whole <laughs> scenario of having all the decision makers right in front of me at the same time. Thank you. Uh, you know, I, I don't disagree, frankly, with some of the things that, uh, that Trevin and Pamela have suggested, uh, you know, tax simplification. Uh, you know, Steve, I lived in Australia for a couple of years. It, 
It took me 15 minutes to do my income tax down there, all in an online form. And it takes me about five hours to do it here in Canada. And there's no no reason why we couldn't simplify some of those things, for sure. Um, but frankly, I think the importance of the tax system, both the level of tax and the design of it, is, is vastly overestimated, typically by people who are trying to get government to do something for them. A vested interest of some kind of tax break or loophole or in the name of competitiveness, a rate reduction. Uh, that will benefit them. But to look at it from the economy-wide perspective, taxes are not our problem. I, I wouldn't be in favor of trying to increase tax revenues in this moment. I do not accept the idea that taxes have to go up, even on the wealthy, to pay for this pandemic. Uh, the government can pay for this pandemic right now with no changes in its tax. And the crucial, the crucial challenge is uh, spending, aggregate demand, and job creation. And tax reforms and tax cuts have very, very weak uh, impacts, particularly in the short run. It's like pushing on a string to give someone a consumption tax holiday or some other kind of tax break right now when uh, people are fearful of what's coming down the world or around the corner and they're going to hang on to that money. So, you know, by all means, let's go ahead and explore ways to make our tax system efficient and a bit fairer, make sure that it's collecting enough money to pay for those long run social programs. That we need. But don't think that taxes are somehow going to fix this problem. We need something very much more direct and powerful to fix this problem. Armin, almost in unison, Christian Freeland and Rod Phillips, the federal and provincial finance ministers say, what taxes should I raise, Armin, if the deficit's too big and we need more revenue, what should we do? So this is a very different question coming from the province of Ontario and the province of, uh, and, and the government of Canada. Um, and I would echo, obviously, because we're in the same room together, my colleague, Jim Stanford, that taxes are not your problem. Your problem is purchasing power. And there are things that you can be doing um, at the federal level that do not require you to raise taxes. And I go to Trevin's point. It's not how much we spend, but how we spend it. What are we spending money on? What is the return on the investment for the dollars? Instead of focusing on the deficit or the debt, we should be focusing on how we can maximize potential in the GDP, both in terms of short term and long term. So we, we would hopefully have both levels of government looking at what are we spending on? Kevin mentioned early childhood education, early learning and childhood education. We will reap what we are sowing right now for the coming decades. And by the way, population aging is something we're not going to duck. One in four Canadians is going to be over the age of 65. This is going to last for decades. And we've got fewer and fewer people coming into the labor market. We're going to need all hands on deck. What are we doing about it? Zip. Nothing. We've been seeing the slow-moving demographic train coming at us for decades, and our solution is bringing more newcomers, bringing more temporary foreign workers. We've got to do better by our own people. So the issue, as Jim has said, is not the taxation side. It's the spending side. And if you spend properly, what you do is increase revenues because you've got more people working, and you've got more people capable of learning and earning. So we already have a sight line on how to get that happening. If you fetishize that it's only private sector businesses that are gonna bring the jobs back, you're not gonna get that purchasing power in place in time. And so I would just go back to saying, um, just underscoring taxes are important, not now, dear, later. And Jim, when the federal finance minister comes back and says, okay, you want me to give an HST holiday to everybody or you know, on some things, on some products or for a period of time, and that's going to balloon my deficit even more. What are you going to say to allay her fears? Oh, I, I wouldn't support an HST holiday, not remotely. I think that would be an enormous waste of money. Uh, I would take the same amount of money and uh, you know strengthen some of the some of the investments that are already being made. Childcare, for example, I, there's a consensus now that childcare is an economic no-brainer. You get the immediate job creation effects from expanding childcare centers and building them. You get the benefits for women's labor force participation. Women have borne the brunt of particularly the double burden of trying to care for kids at home while uh, while trying to do their jobs at home. And then you get the long run benefits from uh, kids who go through high quality child care and have more capacity to earn money down the road. So that's the kind of thing I would use the resources to roll out as quickly as possible uh, and not worry about this idea that we can somehow snap the economy back to life with a bit of tax. Okay. We've got just a few minutes left here, and uh, the Premier has decided that he wants all four of you in his office all at once for one last bright idea. So with a few minutes left, let me give 30, 40 seconds to each one of you, the Premier says, 
Give me one other bright idea that we should do to get this economy going again once we've got the pandemic under control. Trevin, what are you going to tell them? I think one of the great things or one of the silver linings of this pandemic is that um, it's got a lot of Canadians working together, um, whether that's business, labour and government, whether that's provincial and federal governments. Um, and it's really important that we're able to build on that momentum. Uh, and I would say in focusing on reducing interprovincial trade barriers, if we're talking to the premier and also talking to the federal government, this is something that people have been talking about for ages now. Uh, in terms of projections, you know, it seems like we can add about 4% to real per capita GDP of are able to reduce our interprovincial trade barriers. Let's build on that momentum of provinces, federal governments working together. Okay, the to, premier to says he's going to cut you off because he wants to make sure that he hears from everybody before the next <laughs> meeting comes in. Uh, okay, Armin, what uh, what bright idea have you got? I think the big thing that Ontario can do with the backing of the federal government is actually start to pivot towards a cleaner, greener future uh, and putting our industrial base to work to actually help us become a leader in how the world looks at energy production, utilization, and conservation. And I think Ontario should be the poster child for how we do this properly and provide examples for the rest of the world. In addition, of course, to early learning and childcare and making sure that we are adequately funding really high quality caring. The caring economy props up the essential economy. So let's make sure that we don't drop the ball on that premier. That's two bright ideas. Okay. And uh, the, the Premier, being the kind of guy he is, I suspect will let you get away with two ideas. Okay, Pamela <laughs> Cross, let's hear your bright idea beyond what you've talked about on taxation. I'm actually going to bring forward one more taxation pet peeve, which I think is something that will uh, would benefit if a change were made. It is There is a tax disincentive right now to passing a business from one generation to the next. It is better to sell your business to a third party than it is to keep it in the family. These rules have been in place for many years. This is not an option we want our Canadian businesses to have. We want them to be able to keep the businesses in Canada and to grow them here. So I would say, whatever we do, please get rid of those rules to make it an even playing field to keep businesses in Canada in the families that grew them. Okay, Jim Stanford, you get the last piece of advice. I'm going to cheat too, Steve. I got one big bright idea that includes a dozen other ideas. <laughs> I think fighting fighting the coronavirus is like fighting a war, really. And I, I think there's a strong historical analogy to what happened in World War II and after World War II. Uh, and I've argued for a post-COVID Marshall Plan, if you like, uh, a multi-year plan involving, as Trevin says, the federal government, the provincial governments, the private sector, unions, other stakeholders, and say, look, this economy isn't going to snap back. We have to pull it back. We have to rebuild through a systematic, integrated plan to invest in public infrastructure, private investment, new technology, a green economy, the caring services that Armin talked about. And we did that after World War II, and we, we started with a deficit, a debt of 150% of GDP, and it evaporated because we built an economy around it. And I, I'm optimistic that we could do the same thing uh, after COVID, after our war against COVID, but it takes a plan and determination to make it happen. I want to thank you for, for offering such useful advice to our two first ministers and our two finance ministers. And I suspect rather than trying to set up meetings with all four of you, we'll just send them a tape of this and they can play it in their own sweet time. Jim Stanford, Trevin Stratton, Armin Yalnesi, and Pamela Cross, good of all of you to join us on TVO tonight. Thank you so much. Thank you, Steve. Thank you. The Agenda with Steve Pakin is brought to you by the Chartered Professional Accountants of Ontario. CPA Ontario is a regulator, an educator, a thought leader, and an advocate. We protect the public. We advance our profession. We guide our CPAs. We are CPA Ontario. And by viewers like you. Thank you.